excused. Gene Wollerman? Here. Ron Durkoff? Here. Okay. Um, everyone has had a copy of the minutes, I believe. Are there any additions or corrections? I have uh, one addition. I was at the last meeting, so <coughs> they could add my name to the present list. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Got a motion to approve as amended? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and we have um, under new business, Brian Nagler, <coughs> program supervisor at, at the ADRC. And Melissa Sell, also with the ADRC. Welcome. And as soon as uh, Jake is clear, you, you can actually begin your presentation. Okay without the computer. Well, we, we really appreciate you letting us come to talk to you. Uh, we're going to give you a little spiel on what the ADRC is because it's, a, it's still, uh, after eight years of existence, still a little bit of a new thing in our community uh, at the county. Um, this was um, uh, precipitated by Ron and my discussion about your dementia care directive that I think you guys have talked about or are talking about today. Um, and we always look for the opportunity to get the word out about what we do at the ADRC because it's changed a little bit. So I'd like to give you a little bit of a spiel, um, and Melissa will chime in because she's in the front lines uh, as an information and assistance specialist with us at the ADRC. So she can chime in and, and add some real-world knowledge to my presentation because I just sit in the office there and shuffle papers. So <laughs> she does the real work. The real beautiful work that we accomplished is, Thank you again for having us. So then we, after we talk a little bit about what the ADRC is, then we will talk about um, how we utilize power of attorney documents. That's something that's very near and dear to Melissa's heart, all of our hearts. Um, explain the why we're doing those things and then also have a little discussion about this dementia directive and our feelings on that and uh, what we've done to date about um, kind of understanding that document. It's pretty new to our, our world still. So. Um, as Judy, just real quick, we either can we have you sit by the mic or go by this mic, just so that people on that are watching can oh. hear us. That would be great. Absolutely, is this okay? That's good. Yeah, if you just want to stay in there, it's hold fine. it down to short guy mode here. <laughs> um, so, um, as Judy had mentioned, my my role is as program supervisor um, at the ADRC, and. We operate kind of. I I did send the tables of organization, Gene. Did you have a chance to? Get that as well. Uh, yes, he's going to show that after your. Okay, report. perfect, perfect. But where we align as an ADRC, the Aging and Disability Resource Center is a part of the division, the long-term support division of Human Services. That was where, um, when our um, folks, Ron was included in that, um, set up the ADRC. That was where it best fit. So, I'm program supervisor of the AD, ADRC. Um, I have 10 information and assistance specialists that I supervise that do uh, the work that Melissa does, and then also four adult protective services staff that do guardianships, protective placements, emergency protective placements of folks that have dementia um, and are needing some help and maybe a danger to themselves. So. Um, being as how we are, are the ADRC, uh, we're set up a little bit different and we have to have our own kind of staffing patterns um, that, are, that are kind of uh, set forth to us by our, through our contract with the State Health and Family Services. Um, we have to have um, a certain staffing ratio and certain availability to the citizenry of Winnebago County at all open hours of our business. So um, we do have a mission statement, as you can see there. I'm not going to read it, but generally it's to empower and support seniors, people with disabilities, disabilities and their families by providing useful information and finding the help they seek to live with dignity. So um, it's a noble cause. Um, so um, what is an ADRC? Um, the, the ADRC premise is that um, we have no real ulterior motive other than getting people help. Um, we have a responsibility to our citizenry in Winnebago County. 
Um, and we're a place that a person co can come and get accurate, um, unbiased information. Um, we just want to get you the help you need and um, don't have any ulterior motive on where you may be placed or what program you go to. We're just trying to get you the help you need. Um, we should always be a friendly, welcoming place um, where people can come in. Um, I think we, we hit the mark on that. Um, we're very um, welcoming staff, um, big hearts a mile wide. <laughs> um, we provide information on a broad range of, of programs and services. Um, and the one thing that's different, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, and one of the things we do is options counseling. And this is what we're trying to get out to the community yet. Because for the longest time in our, the annals of our history, we've, the county has always been the place that uh, folks go when they didn't necessarily have the means to help themselves. Um, and we still perform that function. But one of the big reasons an ADRC exists is that we do options counseling with people that have their own nest egg. They're sa they've saved for the rainy day, but how best do I spend that? Until I'm kind of in the throes of, of that life event that's happened, I don't really, I, I know I've set this aside, but how do I really use it? Um, the staff such as Melissa get, um, really build a rapport with folks to understand what they're trying to achieve. Um, and then uh, we have obviously a knowledge of all the resources. We're a very resource rich county. Um, very pleasantly, we have a lot of things going on. So um, it's building that rapport and, and working relationship with folks to understand um, how best to use their monies. So um, how do you contact us? Um, we have two locations, one here at 220 Washington, just down the street. Um, we also have an uh, office at 211 North Commercial in Nina. Um, you can contact us via the telephone. Um, we have a website on the county's website. Um, you can email us directly. And then we also, it's kind of a proud moment, we have a Facebook page now. So if you're on Facebook, um, please go out and like us because there's a lot of good information. Um, it's and there's a copy of the PowerPoint in your folder, so don't feel like you have to write down the numbers. Um, we operate 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Um, and one of the things, as you can imagine, we work with people's families many, many times. And that daughter may be coming from Madison after work, so we have to have the flexibility built into what we do to be able to say, I'll meet you at 7 o'clock, and then maybe adjust my next day and come in an hour or late or something like that. We have to have that ability. So our staff is really good about understanding that. Oh, these are some of the friendly faces you'll see. I'm a little bit chastised with some because these, these pictures are quite old in some instances. <laughs> Ron, you may remember those. Yeah, I do. Um, but uh, this is the best <laughs> we funny. have. It's tough to corral a staff this large to be able to get pictures. So these are, um, in some instances, 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> um, that, um, this is the Oshkosh office staff, of which you'll see our friend Melissa there. Um, and then our Nina staff. Um, we do uh, just through growth and through um, a part of which is the outreach we do. We go out into the community and help people to understand what we do do. That makes us busier. So we've uh, recently, Cindy Pluker is our new, newest ad. She's an LTE employee for this budget biennium, but we're looking to get her on the tables of organization for the next go around. So very much a necessary thing. We, we're pretty busy, 8 to 4.30. Can I get an amen, uh, uh, Melissa? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the many roles, I, I mentioned, uh, and I want to keep this kind of succinct, so I'm going to leave you to read the slides, but essentially the three main functions of what uh, the information and assistance specialist does is just that, information and assistance. We do options counseling, and then we do eligibility and enrollment counseling for Wisconsin's long-term care medical assistance programming. So the information and assistance, the best I can explain that is someone may call and, and just need kind of a direction towards, towards a service, like uh, I need help to find where the Parkinson's support group is uh, held in the Menasha area. And we may send that brochure and kind of have a, a small conversation with them follow up with them that they actually received it, but then that may be all we really do with that person. They can take that and run with it. So 
Um, we do maintain, uh, as we showed before, we have a website and we maintain our resource directory both, I think you have a copy, correct? Yep, there's a copy in your, in your folder of our 2018 directory. Uh, there's a committee that works pretty tirelessly to uh, update that uh, resource directory both in paper form and online um, every year. So we pride ourselves on that. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of sending out that resource directory and letting people peruse it at, at their own leisure as they're watching the nightly news or whatever it might be, and then call us back if they need any, any more help. Yes? Brian, uh, a reminder that the Health Department and the ADRC work together to do that sort of a flip folder to help guide people through Correct. that directory. Correct. Because it is confusing if they don't know the terminology. Right. I think uh, one one uh, issue we have in, in our field is that we use our own vernacular quite a bit or our jargon. And not many people know what a CBRF is or an RCAC. Those are assisted living. So Judy's exactly right. We have a flip chart that we hand out quite a bit as well um, that's easier to use maybe. Um, any comments on that? Yeah, it's it's called a quick tip guide. Many people have known it by that. Um, I didn't include it in your folders, but yeah, it is. It's it's nice because it explains like what is a home delivered meal and you know kind of the basics. Um, because the directory, if you flip it, it's like you know a hundred some pages of information, so it could be pretty overwhelming um, for someone. So um, so I think we kind of use our own discretion as far as if we give them both or one kind of um, how the uh, meeting is going, which we'll give them. Um, so. Uh, just information and assistance. Uh, this is, I believe, where our staff, Melissa, completely a part of that, truly shine. Um, it's coming alongside someone, understanding what their needs are, um, helping them to understand that. There's many people who live under the, they've, they've seen loved ones go to nursing homes and stay the rest of their days there. There are so many different options out there for people now. It's just still that stigma when a social worker maybe shows up at your door. That's what we think. Oh, my goodness, I'm going to a nursing home. So we kind of have to overcome that stigma. And um, these guys do a wonderful job of, of quickly building that rapport because the one thing you'll note is that we at the ADRC do not do any long-term type case management with folks. It's really meant to be get them the resources they need to take care of themselves and allow them to do that. And then be there as kind of a liaison if they have questions or problems that come up. But we don't do the long-term case management like we used to do in the COP waiver days. You may have heard that, the Community Options Program, if you remember. Um, Ron knows that all too well. Um, so uh, long-term care options counseling, as I had mentioned before, this is where we um, try to help people with their own monies. Um, they've saved for that nest, egg, that nest egg for the what ifs or the rainy day as we call it. And sometimes it's us coming in and helping them to understand that this is the rainy day. This is when we need to start using that because it's going to maintain you in your home longer. Um, we, God forbid, don't want something bad to happen or a fall and some of those things that kind of precipitate those placements to a nursing home. We don't want that stuff. So um, it's helping them to understand um, that this is the time to use that funds. <laughs> um, options counseling is really a decision supported process. It's kind of a little different brand of, of uh, social work that we're doing with these folks. It's helping them to realize for themselves. Um, we afford them what options are out there and what avenues they may take, but the decision solely rests on them or their families or, or both together. Um, to make that decision. We don't uh, make placement decisions or, or um, d decide which program you might go to. That's completely on you. But hopefully we give good information to help you understand and make an informed decision. Um, it's important to take the time needed to fully understand their strengths and preferences as well as their needs. Um, I guess I said that already. Um, and then the other thing, the, the third of the trifecta that the INA are are the, the big part of their job is the eligibility processing and enrollment counseling for Wisconsin's Medicaid long-term care programs, that being family care and IRIS. Um, we do eligibility for both of them. There is a physical eligibility. Um, we determine that through the use of the long-term care functional screen. You may remember that, some of you. Um, and it assesses um, people's need for help with certain what we term activities of daily living. They're the things that we all did this morning, 
bathing, dressing, brushing your teeth, um, eating, taking our medications, all those things. And then the functional screen assesses what help from another individual do I need to take those ta to make sure those tasks are done each day? And that's the physical eligibility. Um, the financial eligibility for both of those programs is through medical assistance. And that um, is, is not always an easy um, road to navigate for families. Um, we've, we have a lot of, we do a lot of helping um, with getting people eligible for medical assistance. It's actually done through our economic support division, but our INA workers such as um, Melissa have a big role in that because we're the legs to get the verifications because there's um, verifications of income and asset that are needed and we do a lot of hustling to get that to make sure that our people are getting where they need to be. So. Um, the family care programs, I'm sure you've heard about them. I'm not going to go a lot into those, but they're really about choice as well. Um, access to quality services and then cost effectiveness. Those are taxpayer dollars at work. So um, that's the state's um, uh, response to waiting lists and programs that really weren't as efficient as they could be. It's about being as cost effective as we can with the dollars we're spending so we can serve more folks. So, and it's, I think it's proven that it's working very well in our state. Um, what else do we do? Uh, uh, much more than just this one slide, right, Melissa? Um, but we do a lot of case coordination with our adult protective services workers. As you can imagine, people's lives don't happen kind of in a vacuum. So we're working many times with our protective services workers um, who are maybe establishing a guardianship for folks and things like that. Um, our disability benefit specialists for people under 60 who have um, benefits through um, SSI and those types of things and Badger Care and those types of insurances. Um, and then all, also our EBS or elder benefit specialists. Those are all housed within our um, long-term support division. Um, we do uh, just an absolute bunch of coordinating and linking transportation. That's a big deal in our, in our, our city of Oshkosh here, but also our county in general. It's hard for people to get around. So we do a lot of help with that. Um, we have some small caregiver support programs um, that are really utilized um, at our discretion and mostly the INA's discretion um, to be able to keep informal caregiving systems fresh and not burn out. So if, if daughter is caring for mom with dementia in the home, we want that system to exist. That's a beautiful thing going on. But all the while knowing that that person needs respite and they need to be able to get away in order to still be fresh for the 23 hours of the day that they might be caregiving. So um, these beautiful little programs are able to, um, as my predecessor uh, used to say, keep the wolves away from the door. <laughs> um, they're to keep those little... Uh, little systems working and, and they are such a beautiful thing. We see it time and time again where families are really rally, rallying around a loved one with dementia or a physical disability to be able to provide and keep them in the home. Um, our INA staff are also responsible for outreach presentations like we're doing right now. Um, we pride ourselves on getting the word out. Um, that outreach also means inreach and one of the things we're proud of in the long-term support division is understanding that we want to educate the community. We want to come out and educate you today, but we also need to educate ourselves to what's going on in-house. And um, we've made really good efforts to go to other divisions, the behavioral health division um, that deals with mental health and um, the crisis division that handles those things at 2 o'clock in the morning that might occur, um, to un for them to understand what we do and also them to reciprocate and help us to understand how, how we work together. Um, the gathering of resource information, I mentioned that before, um, that's, a, that's really a big task. Uh, I have a little picture there and Melissa just worked to uh, organize our what we term resource wall. That's the wall that our staff utilize when you guys make a call in and they're on the phone with you on their headset. They usually are out in this hallway to get those brochures to maybe send to you or to talk to you about. Um, but also that is available online. So. There's a great, great deal of work that goes into maintaining and making sure that those are absolutely up to date. Because as you can imagine, 
nursing home social workers or whatever it might be, they, they leave. They, that, you know, sometimes those jobs change over, so it's almost a constant battle to keep that updated. Um, and then maintaining records, that's the fun part, right, Melissa, is, is anything we do needs to be documented, and that's the way that we have to be able to show the state what we're doing here in the community. Um, um, we are always uh, open uh, to questions, so if you have, you have our, our contact information, we'd love to hear from you. Um, whether you have a neighbor that needs a referral or you just want to ask, ask a question, um, or you can come and browse brochures. We have on that top left picture, it's off to the, on that left hand wall, but there's something we call the welcome wall where uh, the community can come in and shop for brochures or, or other professionals can come and get, you know, two or three things on hospice or whatever they're looking for at that time. Um, so that's, that's part of our, what should be always a friendly welcoming face. I think that's it for that one. And then uh, the, the I, I don't know that I need the tables of organization if you, if we just want to run. Do we want to yeah. talk about? So we'll kind of switch gears, if you may, to powers of attorney and how those are utilized in our, um, in our agency, and we're helping helping the community to get those filled out. How are we doing on time, Judy? Um. We'll give you about ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, <laughs> and then we'll we'll Did you just come out? encourage everyone else in the group to move along. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. this okay, is, this is really good information to be shared, not only with our committee but the community. Mm -hmm. Sure, Ab so absolutely. We'd rather let you have that time. Okay. Today. Well, thank you. Um, so we're just going to chat a little bit about powers of attorney. Um, so I'll just do kind of a little one hundred and one. This is kind of a, a little. Um, kind of speech I give the consumers that I work with. Um, I try to, depending on their situation, touch on powers of attorney with almost everyone I meet with um, because I think it's such a huge topic. Um, we generally have a lot of other things to talk about. <laughs> so obviously if it's a, a really kind of critical time, I'm not going to be bringing it up. But, um, you know, especially those folks that we run into who are starting to experience some memory issues, we want to get something done as soon as we can. Um, so there are two different powers of attorney. Um, I have them both in your folders, but there's a power of attorney for health care and a power of attorney for finance. And I'm sure most of you already probably know what they are, but a power of attorney for health care form is um, got a couple different um, uh, I guess roles within the document. What the main role is to appoint a decision maker, so that in the event that you are not able to make your own decisions, there's someone to make them for you. Um, because in the state of Wisconsin, we are not a next. Oh, go ahead. Who decides whether or not one works or the other? Can I? I can make my own decisions, and my wife says no, you can't. Who decides? Sure. Oh, I'm definitely going to, I'm going to touch on that in just a few minutes. Yep. Good question. Um, so we are not a next of kin state. So just because my husband is my husband, if something happens to me and decisions need to be made and I'm incapacitated, I'm not able to make decisions for myself anymore, it doesn't default to him. So that's a lot of things, a lot of time, a lot, that's something that a lot of people don't know about in Wisconsin. So it doesn't default to your, your daughter or your husband or your wife. Um, the document has to be created prior to you becoming incapacitated. So what the health care power of attorney document is, anyone who is 18 and older should have one because once you're 18, you're an adult. Um, so um, the health care power of attorney document, there are um, the, kind of the beginning of the document is where you note the people that you'd like to make decisions for you if you're not able to. So, you know, I might put my husband first and my, my mom second. So you can put, you can put multiple agents. Um, Generally, when you put, um, you know, my husband and my mother on the same line, that gets a little hairy because what if my mother and my husband don't agree on something? So people want to put that, and I was just kind of just a little bit nervous about that and just to explain to them that that could, that could cause issues down the road. Um, so you can, you can put one person, you can put five people. Um, it's totally what, what the person would like to do. Um, it's good that that person knows that they're being appointed. So it'd be good if my mother knows that she's my secondary agent because otherwise someday she might get a call and not even be aware that I appointed her. So it's important that everybody knows, you know, sometimes we, we don't have to have the agents who are, 
the agents are the people that we appoint um, don't have to be present when we do the document. So that you might have a daughter that lives out of state that doesn't even know that you're creating the document and knows that you're the person. So we always encourage them to get a document to, to whoever they appoint. Um, and so that, that's kind of the beginning of the document. That's a big piece of the document. Um, the rest of the document kind of goes into, um, and we tend to use the state document. Um, there are many different forms of powers of attorney for health care. You know, Aurora has their own, ThetaCare has their own. Um, we tend to use the state document, um, which is available on our website, or you can just, you can just go online and get it as well. Um, there's also something that, called the Five Wishes, which is another document that we have. Um, you know, personally, I tend to use the state document because it's very, um, when you look at it, it's very clear cut, it's very clean, it's very easy to use. Um, the Five Wishes, I don't know if Brian wants to speak a little bit about that. It's a little, it's a little more, um, there's a little more uh, conversation that happens in it, so. I think it's exactly that. Uh, we know how to utilize the power of attorney documents and how to have that conversation with folks. But really, powers of attorney, are you expressing your wishes to your loved ones who might be making these decisions after you're determined to not be able to make those decisions? So for someone, a, a lay person, if you will, um, I believe that the five wishes does a nice job of doing it in a conversational tone so that if we're meeting with family and having this summit about my health care needs in the future, um, it, it, it allows me to say, what I want to say, or maybe have trouble saying face to face with my family, we can write that down in the five wishes. You know what? I really appreciate that you stood by me in all my illnesses, or whatever mm -hmm. it might be that you want to thank folks for. Um, it's more of a conversation starter for people to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If there are different forms, and you use the state form, but different hospitals. Does one take precedent over another, or are they nope. equally? Valid? Yep. Good question. They're all equally valid. And even the Five Wishes is um, a document that's, I think it's out of Tallahassee, Florida. It's something, um, a conversation starter. But it has to include a form in the back that says that this is valid in the state of Wisconsin. That's a part of that Five Wishes so that it's, it's valid in our state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if somebody wanted to do, you know, generally I bring out the state document when I come out, um, but, you know, if someone wants to use the five wishes or if they have a, you know, when you go to the doctor's office, they are always asking you, did you do your advanced directives? Um, you know, if, and they, they whip out an Aurora form, I'm not going to say, no, I can't use this, you know, we'll help them do whatever form they want to do. Um, we just, you know, tend to, because a lot of the folks are working with, they, they, they haven't done it for a reason, <laughs> or they're maybe nervous to do it, or it's too complicated, so the state document is just super clean um, so that's the one we tend to use but like I said we would use any one someone wanted to do um, so and then the rest of the document kind of flows into questions like um, some of the, the big key questions are tube feeding you know um, how does someone feel about tube feeding and would they allow you know that uh, uh, do they either not want to be um, ever be tube fed or do they give their agent permission to withhold or withdraw a feeding tube um, it also um, you know, talks about what someone's wishes are in, in regards to would they uh, agree to a nursing home or assisted living placement. So kind of, there's a lot of conversation that happens throughout the document. Um, so those are kind of the big kind of key questions within the document. And then it requires some witnesses. Um, so it's the uh, power of attorney for healthcare is very specific about who can witness. Um, it can't be a family member. It can't be one of the agents that you appointed. So if you appointed your daughter, she couldn't sign as your agent, couldn't sign as a witness as well. Um, so we witness a lot of them. So I often will bring a, a, a colleague along to help witness, or if there's a neighbor or a, a friend that joins the meeting, um, they can sign it as well. Um, so it's, it, 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 it can be a very quick um, conversation or it can be a pretty long conversation, but um, a very important conversation. Um, so you asked about, um, I'm sorry, what was your name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Burton's difficult, but like Burton, only with an L. Oh, okay. <laughs> so um, your question about, well, how do I know when it's, you know, you know if, if it has to be... Um, Put into place, and the the answer to that question is um, there's actually a document um, in your folder, and it's called a statement of incapacity. Um, and this is a form. There's a lot of different. This is just just a general form. Your doctor's office has one as well. But two doctors have to assess you and agree that you are incapacitated to make your own health care decisions. So your wife can't say, "No, nope, you're done. 
You're, you're done making decisions now. Um, it requires two doctors, to uh, or a doctor and a psychologist, um, to make the determination that you are incapacitated. And does the person who's the subject go to the doctor's office? Do they... How does that work? Well, you know, generally it could happen in a couple different ways. Um, you know, generally it does get activated in the hospital. Sometimes when people have like a major life event, um, like a stroke or something of that sort, um, you know, or say they're in a car accident or something of that sort and they have a brain injury and they're obviously not able to make decisions, it, it may be activated there. I think that's where it probably happens most. Um, or if people come to us and say, well, I have this power of attorney and we ask them, is it activated? Um, because unless it's activated, that person's still making their own health care decisions. So um, a lot of people say, well, I'm my mom's power of attorney. I can sign everything. Well, is it activated? That's the first question we ask. Tell us a little bit about how do you activate it? Yep. Two, um, again, two doctors have to assess oh, the person. Yep. It. And they have, you know, maybe have like a little assessment Perfect. that they do. Got it. And we sometimes hear a lot of terms interchanged. Mm -hmm. um, incapacity is one thing and incompetence is a different thing. And incompetence, if you will, is something that's adjudicated by a court of law. Incapacity is something that two doctors are stating that this person is incapacitated to make their health care decisions at this time. And the difference being is many, many, many times with incompetence, once that happens, whether it's dementia, that's usually progressive in nature. Folks don't generally, I don't want to say if always, generally gain their competence back. Incapacity can be almost a transient thing where I've had maybe a, a car accident and I'm brain injured, but I may regain that capacity to again make my own health care decisions. That's the difference. Um, so. mm -hmm. Yep, and a power of attorney for health care, if it's activated, it can be reversed. So again, you know, say you have a stroke and you're, you know, super incapacitated at the time and then through some rehab and recovery, you end up kind of regaining, um, you know, your abilities that it takes one doctor's signature to reverse it. So, um, any questions about health care powers of attorney? Otherwise, I'll scoot to the finance quick. And um, Okay, so the, the financial power of attorney is a little bit different than the health care power of attorney. Um, it, um, it is active upon signature. So um, once you, it's, it's actually notarized by someone and it requires a notary, um, where the healthcare power of attorney requires two witness signatures, the power of attorney for finance requires a notary. Um, and we have lots of notaries in our office, so we go out to people's houses all the time and, and do them. Or you can go to your bank or, you know, pay a lot of money and go to an attorney. Um, but uh, you can just come to us, we can help you, and it's just as valid. Um, so the financial power of attorney, again, is exactly what it is. It, it's appointing someone to make financial decisions for you. Um, it doesn't take away your power to make the health or the financial decisions. It just adds someone else's power. So like my husband and I just got married. I made him my financial power of attorney. So if he needs to go into my accounts and take care of the house payment or if he needs to sell my car or whatever it might be, he can do that on my behalf. So you generally want to pick somebody that you trust right away. Um, if you don't want it to be active upon signature, you know, people will just write in there that they don't want it active until they're incapacitated. So that's kind of a, a difference. It's something that people can write in. And there's a section in both the documents where you can write in your own personal wishes. Um, a lot of people just really just, if they've picked an agent that they trust, they just kind of leave it up to the discretion of the agent um, to make those decisions. Um, we also have some uh, information that we give out to people to um, kind of have those conversations. So we have additional information because we're not going to have every conversation at that table at the time. So. Um, is there any questions about that? I know this is really fast. Um, so, uh, you know, we encourage people to, we make we can make copies for them. Um, so we encourage they get their healthcare power of attorney documents to their doctors, um, to their family members, um, their financial documents, again, to their family members and to their bank or any financial institutions that they're working with. Um, again, we don't charge anything for doing the documents. Um, a lot of people think they have to go to an attorney, but you do not have to go to an attorney. Um, if your documents or if your um, power of attorney for health care has not been activated, you can create a new document. So say you five years down the road change your mind, you can create a new one as long as it's not activated. Um, I think I'm going to stop there because I know you have to get going. Let's um, do the dementia one really quick. Okay, Brian. Uh, the dementia care directive, I believe, is very, very exciting. Um, you know, it offers 
the, the powers of attorney that Melissa was talking about are state forms, and that being said, they're utilized for all sorts of populations that might need those. Um, but I believe the dementia directive um, gives us some conversation to be had um, between our family members as to um, the different stages of dementia and um, where we may go aggressive with treatment and, and things and, and keeping person at uh, the, the initial levels of maybe dementia, stages of dementia, I should say. Um, we need to have a conversation with our loved ones to understand what do you want as your disease progresses. And I, and I, I'm very heartwarmed because we didn't have this opportunity with my wife's grandfather, and he was on a medication um, to um, keep his memory as clear as possible, not to cure anything, but to keep him at an early stage. And we didn't really have any direction from him to be able to say, uh, this is when we don't do that anymore. We're just going to let him, his disease progress, and then, um, you know, pass away and uh, it would have been really nice to be able to have that conversation we did end up taking um, my father-in-law did end up taking him off of that but that was a struggle for us and so I believe that this dementia directive is a nice way to have the conversation um, again I think it's, it's uh, um, you know getting it out there and helping people to understand that it's out there because um, it needs to happen in the same conversation that Melissa's having right. with folks and I was gonna, I, I mentioned in my PowerPoint that we do a lot of outreach. One of our focuses, um, we are having a caregiver conference um, in May and also doing um, an elder abuse, world elder abuse awareness event. And anytime we have those types of things, we make powers of attorney available if people wanna come in, but those aren't very well attended. I mean, we do maybe do a couple you know, but we have a whole community here who could benefit from this. So a dementia um, care specialist. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we have a dementia care specialist that we've applied for a grant through the state um, to be able to add that to our ADRC as a position mm -hmm. to be a central point of of contact for all dementia related stuff. And so this would be um, promotion of this would be that person's duty if we're. Those grants there are they aren't for everyone so it was a pretty competitive process with the grants so um, do you have any idea when when you will know the result is there a timeline for the decision making on the for grant the, for the grant there is I can't I don't know like that offhand like months and months or no I don't no. believe so I think we'll know about it probably by I would say early summer oh, just to know yeah absolutely and you know, it's something that's really needed in every county, to be honest, because it's something that we're on the precipice of quite a few folks um, in our, our state, our country, uh, coming to that age where dementia is a real reality and having those, those problems. So we're very hopeful and, and praying about it. So, um, But yeah, I, any, anytime we have an outreach event, you know, it's, it's advertising that these are possibilities. We do powers of attorney we also do dementia screening where we um, do some animal naming and things like that um, to just give people an idea of hey maybe something isn't right we don't diagnose or anything like that we send them quickly to their doctor for further testing but it at least gives people um, a little bit of understanding that isn't okay you know and and that's a scary thing so so those aren't when we do offer those those aren't you know, we don't get very many folks up on that. We do get a few um, because it's a scary reality to come to grips with. So, okay. Well, are there any other quick questions for the ADRC? Just one quick one, and that is: uh, Would this uh, is your thought then that this dementia uh, specific advanced directive would be ultimately an attachment to your department or your uh, health care document that it'll be? not done separately but it'd be done with one okay so yes i think uh, i think where our powers of attorney are just things that we have on our forms rack i think sure. and i have i have feelers out to my contacts at the hospitals for them to understand hey, how is the doctor going to look at this and it's not it's a conversation and and if we have a power of attorney that's activated it but but how do they view that and and i haven't gotten response back just yet because and those doctors haven't met or whatever, but um, we anticipate having it as a 
more of a packet, maybe a folder that our staff can take out and have that start to have that conversation. And it might be um, these are difficult decisions, and, no. and powers of attorney aren't always easy decisions. We allow our staff to be able to have multiple appointments with an individual if that's what it takes. You know, these are are pretty weighty decisions about who I want to make. You know, my, my loved one, or do I really want to put that on my wife to make those difficult decisions, or do I want to have someone who's got a little bit more objectivity in the family? Real, real deep-seated yeah. thoughts on that, and we all have our own thoughts. So, um, again, that rapport building and understanding and, and relationship building with the consumer out in the field um, to, to be able to feel comfortable to have the conversation with us. Okay, well, I'm going to cut you off, Brian. I hate I to promise. do that. There's good I'll information. Well, <laughs> I'll bring you back again. <laughs> thank you. But thank, thank you. you so much. Very good. Thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We'll go on with the rest of our meeting. Uh, committee reports uh, strengthening our partnership with neighborhood associations and other partners. Jean? Uh, I have nothing to report for this month. Okay. Actually, uh, I think uh, Alexa here could maybe provide us with the names and of the head person for the neighborhood situations and when they meet. And then Jean and I could divide that up and so we'll go at least one meeting to whenever the neighborhood does their regular meeting and explain who we are and if there's any way we can be of help and what sort of things we ought to know about. And so can you tell Alexa to? I, I, <laughs> yes, I can. They started meeting at the Senior Center, so I will, Ann Schaefer is uh, part of that neighborhood association, so she is going to, you're going to be having a meeting with them, so we'll set that up okay. with that neighborhood group. So. Okay, the next committee, improving uh, access to affordable transportation and delivery services for seniors. And I don't have anything really to report. Um, Claude or Peggy? One thing I want to ask, it seems like we've been hitting a, a wall all the time of transportation. Like I said, I've been involved in uh, the Committee on Aging for about, going on about 15 years, and one of the subs that comes up is transportation. And I wish I could told people, because people, a lot of people are, are, are on Social Security, and you're on Social Security. If you're just on Social Security, you're probably on the poverty line, like you can't afford to take uh, the, the cabs or like whatever they want to go where you want to go. And them are the people I kind of worry about. And, uh, and I hope that we can find something out to our organization here. Right. Oh, transportation. Also the health department, the ADRC, uh, um, Community care, a lot of the East Central Planning Commission, they're all working on that. I know, that's the problem. It, I'm going to ask you another question. How much money does the ADRC get for, for their programs now? They've got like they got six or seven people on a payroll, but do they give any money to anybody to give me a 50 cents so I can ride a, the bus or something like that? I'm not in a position to answer I that. I was going to ask some people that by that want to prolong this question. Claude, Claude just I a knew. second. Ron was with the ADRC. Yeah. And he can give up what was when he was there. Well, they, they have some resources for some of that smaller, uh, those smaller issues, but uh, I, I've, I've been gone from that for a oh, while now. A few so, years. But uh, it, it'd be worth contacting anybody who's struggling with uh, where, do I, where do I start with transportation. I would direct them to the ADRC. Uh, one ADRC. of the things Brian okay. talked about was that they get a lot of questions on ADRC and, or, excuse me, on transportation and how do I get from here to there. A lot of organizations don't have the, the capital to do a lot of things too, and that's what I was wondering. Right, and, and they do, but I don't know that they're handing out uh, money for dial -a ride and so forth, but they can give the people the direction that they need. By doing, uh, by doing those option screenings, then they find out what they right. are eligible for. They may get uh, be referred for family care services, community care services, and within those organizations there may be dollars allocated. Right. So the ADRC is going to be that first step in that. 
of going, getting the screening, and getting the referrals out. And they do a wonderful job of it. They really do. Okay. Um, creating community design and policy that supports age-friendly community. That Lurton? Yeah, the uh, Larson Winchester Lions Club will help build wheelchair ramp construction programs, except in Oshkosh. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. we can't do that. And I say we not in the city of Oshkosh due to workload and other factors. So, that's no longer an option for us. Okay, thank you. I had a couple of updates uh, in that regard. At our last meeting, we talked about Assembly Bill 629, the Uniform Adult Guardianship Jurisdiction mm -hmm. uh, Bill. Uh, that got passed by the uh, Senate as well, so it's on to the governor for signature. Uh, another of those that we talked about at our last meeting, uh, AB 655, that's the supported decision-making uh, agreements. That also got passed and is on to the gov governor for signature. Yeah, and uh, and then there was, um, let's see, AB 628, we talked about it at the last meeting, that had to do with uh, silver alert referrals to the uh, ADRC and Department of Transportation, did not pass the Senate and uh, probably will be brought back in the next legislative session. So. Uh, that's just an update on that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I had been asked uh, by Beth Culp, who's the director of the Aging and Disability Resource Center, to uh, write a letter of support for a dementia care specialist program that we talked about a little bit earlier here, uh, which I did and it went to Judy and to Ray for their uh, review and input. Uh, and. Uh, Hopefully, well, there's an ADRC. I'll jump in. Yes. The timeline on that was very short, and Beth went to Ron because she was familiar with him. Um, it, when you listen to Brian and Melissa, you know how badly needed it is. Peggy, Julie, the folks that you work with. Um, so Ron wrote two versions of the letter and let me know as he was leaving town for vacation and I got contacted Ray the, as soon as possible and ran it past him before we proceeded and he gave the okay to it. And the only part that actually alludes in that whole letter that alludes to the Committee on Aging is Ron saying that he is a member of it does not say necessarily that we had brought it to the committee and the whole committee voted. Um, there, just, there just wasn't time and Ray, when I talked to him, said we weren't spending city dollars, it was okay that we could let the letter go through with the Committee on Aging mentioned. So thank you, Ron. Well, hopefully it, it helps uh, support that position being granted to Winnebago County. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then we finally have some work done with the improved community communication and visibility of available services to seniors. And Julie, Ron, and I met last week, and they've got quite a list of goodies. Yeah, we um, started off by um, arranging presentations for the rest of the year, so I think we have a good handle on the present presenters for the rest of the year. Um, I believe next month is Denise Parrish, the president of Mercy Medical, that will be coming in to discuss um, various aspects of Mercy and what new things that they have going on there. Um, we also talked about um, proper protocol and how to um, maybe get certain things done and we weren't sure exactly how um, to go about some things as far as like updating a website or uh, maybe creating a page um, specifically for seniors on the city um, website. So that's a separate conversation we want to have with Jean and Ray um, to find out how to go about that. Um, so we can discuss that. Um, and things such as submitting articles to the Oshkosh Herald or Oshkosh Northwestern. Um, we also talked about the um, website itself and different links and information that could be included on there because we did feel that there was enough information that could support that. 
So, Brad? I think she covered it really well, and in the interest of time. Okay. And I did contact Ray. We will be uh, setting up a meeting date. Um, we, I, I think the three of us walking out of that meeting that day felt more energized um, of what we can do to communicate to the committee or community that um, a lot of times just having those links, be it the ADRC or anything else, the wall that's being done or room that's being done at the senior center is a good starting point, but not everybody is necessarily going to come over there, but linking on the Committee on Aging or whoever that does get set up can be another one of those safer, mm -hmm. uh, what people would consider a safer way of looking for uh, particular information. So thank you. This is really good timing because the, um, the city ID de IT department is um, currently developing a new city website. So every department is being asked to refresh in their pages. We are being asked not to cut and paste from our existing sites. Um, so it's a good opportunity for us to sit down with our IT director or manager and, and give some input to him. So um, Jean, like I said, Jean mm -hmm. and I can help on that process. But right. just know, go through Jean because she's your mm -hmm. liaison here. And if I need to help out in any way, I definitely will. But Right. OK. Um, we were going to do a Medicare card update. Uh, we don't have the link for that video. So in the interest of time, we're just going to continue with the sort of the rest of the agenda. We do, um, last month, Chris Kniep was here, um, seriously considering joining the committee. But because of some other commitments she has, she said she'd like to wait until next year and reconsider at that time. So we still have one opening. And we also have, I believe, one person whose term expires this year. And um, would they like to extend for another three years? Um, in our packet. Um, is it me? Sandy, that is you. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, in the packet that we just got emailed to us, um, it shows that your term expires this year and Ron also, because Ron was appointed as a fill-in. So please let us know if you would like to continue, or we hope you will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or if you, if you have other things in life that you're going to try to do. Um, just, just real quickly on the, the whole appointment process, because again, it's, I think it's a little bit new for the committee as you're getting more unversed with the meetings. Um, what will happen if your term is expiring? Uh, typically, um, we are asked by the city manager's office and the mayor's office to contact if it's you, Zandy, that's uh, going to be expiring. If you're interested in renewing your term, um, we then relay that to the mayor. And um, if there's other appointments that he may want to look at, but at this point, I don't think we have any because you still have an open spot. So if you're interested, I'm sure Gene will reach out to you. Um, from the, from the mayor saying, are you interested? And then he um, takes you to the council and reappoints you at that point. So there's really no vote by the Committee on Aging. It's a mayor appointment, so. I was but, no, I, I understand, <laughs> but for the people out in the audience, um, oh, good. so, Boy. just so they understand. And if there's anybody watching or listening um, and know of anybody interested, definitely um, you can go right on the city website. Um, on the left-hand side, you, there's a drop-down menu, I want to, and you can apply for boards and commissions there. So I um, encourage you, if you have an interest, to, to apply. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I think if we could just go back. Ron, I know you have that form for that Medicare uh, information, if you want to just explain that quickly. Uh, oh. We can try to run the video next month, okay. but I think it's important that we start talking about the new Medicare cards. So Ron, if you want to Well, just, just a, uh, a little cookie then. Uh, the new Medicare cards are to prevent fraud, uh, fight identity theft, and keep taxpayer dollars safe. And uh, the new cards will begin coming out in Wisconsin beginning in June. Um, and uh, people should be, have their card by no later than April of next year, but uh, Wisconsinites should have their cards I would think June, July, right in that area. Uh, the big concern is uh, the Federal Trade Commission warning against scammers. Um, it's 
ripe for that sort of thing, people posing as Medicare agents uh, or health care providers telling seniors they need to purchase a replacement card. That's totally false. Uh, they do not need to do anything. Uh, as long as the Social Security Administration has their current address, uh, that card will come to them in the mail and uh, they don't need to do a thing. So if they are contacted by someone asking about their, their did they get their new Medicare card and, and if they haven't, oh, just tell me what your Social Security number is and I'll help you, it's a total scam. They should hang up. Uh, they're, they're fraudsters, if you will. So, um, and there, are, uh, there is a number to call. Uh, it's 1-800-MEDICARE, which translates into 1-800-633-4227. That's 1-800-633-4227. Uh, if they do get such a call uh, asking for um, their private information or their Social Security number or anything like that. So hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. Anything else? I just, can I just make one comment in follow-up to the presentation? Yes. Um, just a personal plug for the elderly benefit specialist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have one in Oshkosh, Joan Jaworski, one in Nina, and they are available to any of us. And I have personally worked with Joan on some insurance appeals, claim appeals. Oh. <clears throat> and she, they have so much information that I carry her cards with me right. and hand them out as I go along. So just for anyone that doesn't know that, um, they're there for all of us. And there's no charge for their there's services. No charge. Right. There's no charge. Right. <laughs> and, and, ag and again, with either Joan or Julie, they're very, uh, they're willing to talk to you, even if it's about oh. veterans uh, issues, and then, you know, they'll sort of filter through and then do your, the referral to the veterans um, office. Right. So they're great on that also. So I will take a motion to adjourn. Make a motion that we adjourn. Motion is made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. We'll see you.